Toy Tractor Times is at the 2018 National Farm Toy Show in Dyersville, Iowa. We're here with Dan Mayer and Andrew Winchittle, who have taken first place in the very competitive small scale division. Congratulations, guys. Uh, we'll just kind of look at the display. This is a very impressive display with hand built pieces out of brass. Almost everything you're looking at on this display was built by brass by Andrew, uh, the landscaping done by Dan. So well done guys. I can't wait to take the tour of the display. When you take first place at the National Farm Toy Show, you win a gold trophy that is a model of the year's tracker. And this year, Toy Farmer Magazine, who hosts the show, had an international 886 produced by Ertl. And that is atop the golden trophy for first place for this year's show. Well deserved by the guys. And let's start taking the tour of the display that earned the gold. Guys, this is an amazing display, and Andrew was the lead on building the pieces for the display. And when people walk in here from a distance, they think this might be a 132nd scale display because you have a lot of crone equipment, and that has traditionally been produced in 132nd scale. We can see this crone Big M2, and this is actually all hand built from brass. And I've got a standard Ertl 164th tractor here, a Ford TW35 just to show that this is 164 scale and just amazing. And one of the things that I like that you've done is to show that this is all made out of brass and it looks great, it's not 3D printed. And here it is on the TV screen and we can see what it looked like before it was painted. This is an absolute piece of artwork. Uh, I imagine you have to use jeweler's tools or a lot of things to try to get this detail. Yes, I do. I actually, uh, those are the first websites I go to when I look for tools or jeweler jeweler websites. Um, so a little bit about the Big M is I do try to make everything as functional as possible. The rear wheels do turn and it does fold. And I tried to mimic the real hinge points and how that folds as close as I could as well. That is just beyond impressive. Thank you. And we even got the driver inside. So how many hours goes into putting together a piece like that? I don't know on each individual piece, but over the whole display, I estimate around 1,000 hours on all the pieces. Wow. And there are a lot of pieces that we'll be taking a look at here and uh, a lot of them built from this brass and uh, the win is just well deserved when we're going to look at all the neat pieces that you just can't buy off the shelf. Well, let's, uh, let's start walking around and uh, talking about the pieces on the display and then uh, I think Dan's going to share the story and kind of what's going on here. Yeah, so for this display uh, we wanted to, uh, of course, compliment Andrew's amazing pieces uh, and the goal with that was to show uh, the four stages of an alfalfa chopping scene, or, and this would be uh, based in uh, central Minnesota, that's kind of what we're going for. Uh, time frame on this would be second cutting alfalfa, so we're looking at uh, early June to mid-June. Um, we've got the alfalfa field right here. The first part of the process of chopping alfalfa, of course, is uh, uh, laying it down, and for that we got Andrew's Big M here opening up this uh, alfalfa field. And what did you use to create the alfalfa? Because it, this is probably the best I've seen as far as replicating that look. And we'll come around here and show the big M cruising through it. Right, and so the, of course, uh, this is probably one of the most challenging parts of this display. Uh, and it was pretty crucial because it was going to be right out front. And I wanted it to look uh, very accurate because, I mean, when you got pieces like Andrew's, uh, if you don't have it looking right, it's not going to, it's not going to, it's really going to hurt uh, his pieces. So. To do that, it's uh, it's uh, multiple layers of static grass mixed in with some brown foam. Um, and that's kind of what they use for leaves on trees on other displays. Yes, yeah. uh, back in the past, before the static grass got so popular, uh, ground foam was uh, very popular. There was uh, most everybody used it on their displays, uh, and it's kind of gone phased out because the static grass has gotten so popular. However, I find that it's still a very useful product for uh, scenery work. And in this case here, making this alfalfa field was uh, very crucial. So, so yeah, like I said, it's uh, multiple layers of uh, static grass, which I call actually growing it, mixed in with some very pretty heavy layers of the ground foam. And I actually use a stocking to make the ground foam even finer than what it comes out of the package. Okay. 
Uh, and then topped off at the final stage, I did add a little bit of a uh, purple uh, ground foam to it to give the flowering effect. You know what? I can see that now that you mention it. If we yep, and it's a little that. hard to see in the light out here, but I've had some people say that once they finally see it, like, oh wow, you really got the, uh, even got the a blooming alfalfa in there too. Yeah, that's really neat. And we come up here, I mean, again, looking at Andrew's mower, I mean, the springs and everything on this header as it goes through. and. So we also can see, kind of looking up here, getting that drone effect coming across the field, we see it being mowed, and then you even have like the lines where the alfalfa was seeded, yep. uh, right behind there, and uh, the, the discolored kind of yellow, silvery brown of the mowed alfalfa stems. Oh, and of course that's kind of, uh, I don't know what I want to call that, my, uh, that's kind of my identity is the stubble rows and stuff like that, and of course I had to fit that in here. Uh, tried to give a little, alfalfa's got a little more unique stubble look to it. It's a little more patchier and uh, it's got a little bit more uh, uh, bulk to it and stuff like that. So I tried to capture that. Of course, like you said, mentioned the color of it. It's quite different than what the top of the crop looks like and uh, tried to capture that the best I could. This field is uh, where I got the stubble here is actually a little bit darker green than the field across the way to show that this is more freshly mowed. Um, the wind rose again is static grass um, mixed in with some of the ground foam and a little bit of the purple uh, now how ground do you, foam. How do you glue a wind row down like that? You know, this was, a, this was one of the bigger challenges too, not only with the uh, alfalfa, uh, actually making the alf standing alfalfa, but to make the right looking wind row uh, was a challenge itself too. Uh, for that, I, I started down by taping off where I wanted my wind rows with uh, some masking tape. And then I went in with a brush with some matte medium uh, watered down. Um, and then I, I brushed that on, uh, started placing my first layer of static grass on that and got a good stick on that. Uh, sprayed it with uh, the matte medium after that. And then I did another layer of it and sprayed it and added brown foam as I went. Um, Try to give this, the, the Big M can throw multiple ways, have multiple ways of throwing their wind rows. Uh, this is one that I seen on a picture that I tried to capture that's got a little wider ones on the outer wings and then it's a little narrower in the middle so that way it's not running over it uh, as it's going down Very the field. Cool. So, uh, pretty happy with how that turned out, um, but, so. I can see, I mean, it's just like the real thing, only smaller. Yeah. Well, let's um, kind of look at the roadside here. We've got probably like a Timothy orchard grass kind of Yep. So on the side. And so beans, this is uh, early June uh, to mid-June. Uh, tried to make sure the ditches were really full and wanted to give some texture by adding some of that ground foam in there to uh, mimic some weeds and stuff growing up in there. They obviously probably haven't gotten out and mowed the roadsides yet. Um, just to, just wanted to give, you know, that uh, real looking roadside ditch look. So, and uh, on the highway, um, I actually went in and beveled the highway so it would drain like the uh, actual highway. Nice. I definitely see that a little bit of an arch. Yeah. And then we've got a classic, uh, I'm going to guess a 4020 coming down the road with a wheel rake. Yes, it is. I have to give credit to Aaron Jensen for finishing that for me. However, I will take credit for doing uh, the brass work for the front end and the three point, and as well as the air cleaner and muffler. Brass everywhere. That's very cool. Now, did you make the rake as well? Yes, I did. Uh, tractor fab wheels or uh, rakes but the rest of it is scratch built. What brand of rake? Uh, it's modeled after an H&S. Okay. Well we'll uh, move over here to the next stage so we've got the, the mowing and yeah we'll jump over to the merger here. Let's talk about the merging. Uh, what happens is uh, we look at we've got the big M mower mowing down uh, I think they mow about 30 feet yep. at a time and then uh, these uh, self-propelled forge harvesters can take a lot of material so you'll merge them into a windrow and the machine being used for this is an Oxbow 334 and uh, these are really cool to watch. So tell me a little bit about this. So yeah, this is kind of the second stage of the process and that would be the uh, merging of the alfalfa. They'd be taking uh, a 34 foot pass, throwing it into one windrow and then coming on the opposite side of it and throwing another 34 foot windrow. Uh, into it, so so basically you're taking in 68 feet of, of alfalfa at one time with a chopper. And we can kind of see this over here, because oftentimes this can go in any direction. You can mow the field north to south and windrow it east to west, or you can pick up half a windrow 
exactly. or, and uh, throw it in the bigger one. However they want to do it, that's how they can do it. Uh, we're actually kind of modeling that this uh, uh, merger is just finishing up the field and kind of heading back to the yard here. He's probably going to shut down for the day. This would be kind of modeled uh, more in early in the morning. They would have cut this field that they're in right now probably uh, late afternoon uh, into the evening uh, last night and it's finally ready to go. He'll probably be shut down for the rest of the day until later uh, this evening when they'll go and chop the other field that the big end is cutting right now. Okay. And this guy most likely will be done for the day or he'll go jump in another wagon tractor. So that's kind of what we're trying to show right there, him coming back to the yard here. Sure. Well, Andrew, you want to tell me about, I'm um, guessing this is also built yes. out of brass. <laughs> yes, this is all scratch built from brass. Um, this was a very challenging piece. I was able to go measure one up. Um, for the amount of time I have into it, I can't comment on that. However, just to create uh, the correct pivot point on this one hinge, so it would fold correctly, I had three nights into it. I should try, to, <laughs> try to make everything as functional as possible. Um, it also does function where the wheels will turn as the tractor turns and the three-point moves. I will say that I, I visited Oxbow's headquarters in Byron, New York in 2002 and they had a 1 16th model built as they were preparing to build the real ones and put them on the market. And This one is uh, far superior to the <laughs> one the company actually was showing at the time. Thank so you. It's uh, just amazing. And then on the merger we have the versatile 290. Uh, the story here is it was the Custom Farms uh, larger tractor until they leased the 365s and in order to show that we wanted to leave the front hubs on and the weight bar on the front as it will be used in the fall for tillage or some other sort of activity. Well it's neat that uh, we've got the slightly older versatile with the cream and red and uh, last year versatile announced they were going back to those original colors um, from the 70s with the yellow red and black uh, any reason why the farm chose to go to versatile or just a cool tractor or? it's uh in our you know this isn't based off any particular crew but we kind of figured that this would be a great uh, tractor for this crew uh, good, good power and uh, uh, a little cheaper than maybe the bigger name brands and stuff sure. like that. Just a good brand choice for them and that's probably why they went with it more than everything. Well, I know my friend Mike Less, who works for Versatile, has a cool YouTube channel, would definitely uh, admire this display. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, one of our, we never planned it that way, but uh, we actually found out that the 290, he actually has a video with that exact setup, not with the merger, but the exact tractor with the hubs in. Neat. that tractor so it was really cool to see that after he did that so, so we know uh, Andrew did a little uh, brass modification to that 4020 down there on the H&S rake uh, what kind of modifications were put into these uh, versatile tractors well for these versatiles uh, they started as an Ertl tractor however I replaced the exhaust I got completely scratch built that from brass and used the photo etch mesh to create the shroud um, the rims are all made out of brass, except for the front rims on the 290. I did use the Ertl ones. Um, I did the three points, the mirrors, and I used the front axles off the spec cast Massey Ferguson's. And one of the cool details about uh, Andrews that I don't think a lot of people notice when they walk by here today is that uh, all the hydraulics go into actual hydraulic outlets. He's got real hitch pins in them, and on the dump wagons, he's actually got the safety chains on them hooked up. So that's a detail that probably not a lot of people notice, but uh, definitely, in my opinion, is probably a first in this scale. But I'd say that's why you took first place yeah, as well. I, I so. think so too. And again, you got the drivers in there. Um, you know, that's a big thing. People have to. Yeah, the tractors. And we'd like to, we got to thank Chris Delva for that. He actually, of course, it's his figure, um, and he actually hand painted them for us, which is, uh, we really appreciate that because he does an excellent job painting them. So. Yes, he did. Well, let's um, walk over here and talk about the chopping process because here's another very cool piece to see. Another standout piece on this display is a Crone Big X650, and these are really impressive forge harvesters. I've got a chance to film a few for big tractor power. And we're gonna talk to Andrew again about how he built this. I mean, again, look at all the detail that goes into making this brass piece. I can't imagine not being singeing your fingers a few times trying to get this detail as we can look on the screen here. 
all these intricate brass pieces that were used and soldered together to create this piece. Let's walk over here and talk to Andrew about the Chrome Big X. And just, uh, again, it looks flawless, like it was made in a factory when it's all painted. What, what went into building this chopper? Well, with this, well, with actually both Chrome pieces, I started with a 132nd scale model, and I was able to use that to, for all my measurements. However, for the hay hat, I did have to build that off of pictures. Um, again, all scratch built. The hay head is removable. I think I saw it in the slideshow of the brass. There's a corn head as well. There is. I have that right here. The easy collect. It's kind of like a big chainsaw. <laughs> Look at all the teeth and everything that goes. If you'd like to see one of these in action, check out Big Tractor Power, put Chrome Big X, Big Tractor Power on YouTube, and you can see one of those headers at work. They're amazing. I don't have to do that. Although I did watch a lot of videos of them already. Sure. <laughs> and I studied a lot of pictures. So tell me about uh, Big X 650. It's kind of a mid-range uh, chopper probably, or on the smaller, because I know they make an 1100, a 700. I believe so. Um, to be honest, I don't know much about the sizes because it seems like they've been changing them a lot from year to year. So uh, the 132nd scale, this is what I had to go off of, so this is what I focused on. Sure. So we've got the uh, spout, where the spout rests here on the back and just all the intricacies of the engine compartment. Got the driver, the win what do you use for the windows and everything? I took uh, 20 thousandths inch clear styrene and I was able to heat it and shape it. That's just to be able to get that curved window. You got the windshield wipers on the side. Yeah, I burned my fingers more shaping that window than I did on the rest of the pieces. Okay. <laughs> you have all the hydraulic lines to the header. I'm gonna just walk around and show people the front side here. So now, on the spout, does it actually flip? Is that self-adjusting or? Yes. It will move. And the end will. Wow. It does raise up and down, however, to make it, uh, the, uh, at this level, we had to stick a piece of wire in there to hold it. Okay. And then we have the chopper pulling a water tank to keep the haylage from coming up in the spout. Oh, that's neat. Where I live in Kentucky, they have to do that a lot. And a lot of times they'll just pull that behind a pickup truck and dump water on the windrow. So that's neat to okay. save time and yeah. you got it all plumbed right into the chopper. Yeah, that's something we haven't seen before, so we wanted to show that. The tank on that's actually all scratch built out of brass, too, of course. Wow. So that's a detail he didn't mention I thought was uh, worth noting. So that black tank itself is made out of brass, or is yes. that? Wow. Well, let's talk also about the Penta, uh, what, I guess, I, I don't know if they're wagons or dump. Kind I believe of the they're a dump cart. Dump cart. Um, I was able to go to Owatonna, Minnesota and measure one up. They were nice enough to let me do that. They scale out very close. They are fully functional. They do raise and the back end gate does, does well. Oh, they're just kind of like a big dump truck for a tractor. Pretty much. Know. Uh, All about of material. The DB40 uh, holds 40 cubic meters or 1,400 cubic feet. It probably takes about two, three minutes to fill one with a chopper like this. Well, Dan, let's talk a little bit about the landscaping because I, I've noticed uh, as we were looking over here at the merger, again, we talked about how you have those seeded paths. We come up here and stop, and then we can follow the headland down across and then we've got the the same thing happening here on this side so again also we can see how it curves around the power pole there uh, just impressive right so like I said earlier this is kind of my signature if you want to call it that is the stubble rose it's I do these uh, by using a field jig uh, that I kind of came out with a couple years ago with the help of Chris Delva uh, and kind of taken it and ran and done a lot of different things with it and uh, so the fun thing about this was being a central uh, Minnesota farm there's not a lot of auto steer and stuff like that so 
I was able to be uh, pretty creative and be able to make some overlap and some skips and stuff like that. And of course, the overlap on the headlands and stuff like that that you'll see on the display, um, as well as some uh, patchiness to the alfalfa and stuff yeah. like that. So this was a really fun yeah, you feel see for that, me. Yeah, that patchiness up here on the headland. This is where your most compaction, most traffic back and forth and you know a yep, more worn out exactly and then uh, right where the gate is there i really tried to capture that being a high high traffic area and of course you're going to have a uh, hard time growing much right in that area so i was very happy next to the alfalfa field that was one of my favorite parts of the display and it was a like i said just a real fun uh, uh couple of fields to make because i was able to be kind of creative and show some different things uh that i hadn't done in the past i'd use more of an auto steer type look and stuff like that and I'm pretty pleased with how it all turned out. So, and again, we've got the hydraulics and the hitch pin off this Penta, and then uh, they're both uh, versatile 365s on these. Yes, that's correct. correct. And we, uh, Andrew, went with uh, floaters on them as kind of showing the progression of those uh, things getting more and more popular. People putting them on. Um, Another idea we had that this crew, would, this custom crew, would possibly run some manure tankers in the fall too. So that's sure probably why, why they would like the choice. Detail that on the tractors, that I, I don't know if Andrew missed or not, but uh, the rims on these uh, uh, 365s are, uh, uh, they're all scratch built, the rims are. So it's a really impressive detail that I don't think everybody notices when they walk up, um, unless they see the picture of it on like the raw see the, form. the bolts in there. It yep, makes, he's got the lug nuts and everything on them. So makes me think I got a lot of work to do on my display when I get home. Yeah, it sure does, yep, so. So uh, we've talked about mowing, we've talked about the merging, and of course the forge harvesting itself. Yep, this now is the we'll, third stage here of the actual chopping, and they're filling the wagon up. Um, and now we can uh, move on to the actual of uh, bringing it into the yard and bagging it. All right, let's take a look at that. We've got the versatile 365 tractor and the Penta DB40. It looks like it's just unloaded, headed back to the field where the other one's filling. and. It looks like they're using an ag bagger here to uh, wrap the silage for storage. Sometimes you put it in a silo, sometimes in a big silage bunk. Uh, tell me a little bit about this. Yep, so the theory on the bagging scene, uh, and this is the fourth and final uh, kind of stage of the process here, um, we kind of figured that this little area of the farm would be kind of their overflow. So this is where they bag if they run out of room in their silos or bunkers or whatever they might have. Um, and that's what I'm trying to show here uh, in this yard or what we try to show we got the bagger. Um, I also tried to show that maybe there was a bag here at one time trying to get the patchy grass effect that this is uh, not going to be a perfect uh, patch of grass right in here. Um, so with the bagger, that that would actually be the custom cruise bagger and the actual tractor, the case Puma there, would be uh, supplied by the farmer himself. So, okay. And Andrew can uh, elaborate on more on the actual bagger and, and the tractor okay. and stuff there. The bagger is based off a uh, Agbag G7000. Again, completely scratch built. I did try to make everything functional as well. When I lift it up, it's going to catch on the axle of the tractor, but it will fold, fold up, and these wheels do turn. And I made a hitch so it can go. So uh, you would in, tow it down the road. So you correct going this way. Uh, the hitch would be going this way too. So okay. So I yeah, see, so it swings way. around them. Yep. Told around the road. Um, we used actual cable for the well, for the cables for the backstop. Oftentimes, people have used string in the past for that, and we, Andrew with the extra mile and used the actual cable for that. It's actually gonna, from the jewelry section <laughs> in Hobby Lobby. I'm going to tell you what. I I just never want to make a display again after seeing this because it it's a, there's a lot to catch up on. It's awesome. And a couple things with the ag bagger that it is it is hitched up the pto is hooked up the, the on the puma the three point does raise up and down i did try to have the third arm movable okay. what model puma is it's kind of neat that it's a two-wheel drive uh 180. okay i had to do a lot of searching to find a actual picture of a two-wheel drive 180 but they are out there and after I had it built, my brother was over and he says, this tractor needs a rock box. And I said, well, I was thinking of putting the loader on it. So uh, he said, well, you better go, better go ahead and do it. Well, nice. So, uh, this is based off of a Case IH L775 loader. 
Um, I put the quick attach on there so I could also use the same attachments on my skid loader. Yes, and then we've got a, a case skid steer right over here. Yeah, so this is a uh, case SR220. I scratched both this about a year ago. The attachments, different attachments, and it does raise and lower. All made out of brass. All brass. I noticed a detail because I do film ag bagging for big tractor power. Uh, you've got the, uh, what brand of um, wrapper are you using? Uh, we're actually using up north, uh, we're modeling up north bags and that's the box that they come in. It's, uh, they're actually called uh, up north plastics. Um, is what, what they call their bags, up north bags. Um, they make a lot of different other things. So we're just trying to model that. They would have probably just brought the whole pallet of bags out here, even though they're gonna use one because they are quite heavy when they are in the box. Oh, so, especially these bigger 12 It's amazing, bags. you got a box like that and you're gonna end up with this. Right, exactly, yep. So now tell me, what did you, we can see this says up north all the way across it. What did you use to create the wrapped look? Cause it's basically like a big trash bag with uh, the alfalfa inside it. Exactly. Um, so on the bags, uh, about the only thing we're going to give away on our secret for them is that we use foam as the base okay. to get the bag shape. Uh, we had a, Andrew was actually, Andrew and I are 10 hours apart and he actually came out uh, to my place to help work on it a little bit and to go over some stuff um, for a couple days. And the last day our goal in the morning was to get the bags figured out. Well, that ended up taking the whole day and... Uh, a lot of frustration and a lot of money trying to come up with a bag. We weren't happy when he left. I wasn't happy when we just weren't happy with it. We didn't know what we were going to do because we said the bag could make or break our whole display. Tell you what, detail. I so. see the wrinkles here, just like a real plastic bag. And uh, I'd say you got it right. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of frustration with there. We're kind of holding the trade secret there to ourselves for a little bit, but because uh, we got some other ideas. So, okay. but. A lot of people have asked about it and we've kind of just been like, yeah, with all our frustration and money we have into it, we're going to hold it secret for a little sure. bit until we do what we want with it. So I will give people the hint that it is a, a foam base though, okay. that we shaped. And actually, Andrew did all the bags. We we worked on them together when he was there, but uh, I ended up uh, pawning it off on him to get them done and he did a great job on them. So. Yeah, sure the did. logos on them, when he sent me pictures of them with the logos on, I was like, yeah, we got it figured out. Now. Yes, so. and I also like how you got the kind of the pallet and the uh, tire down here holding it closed. Yep, Is so it? I've, there's several ways that we've seen people do that to kind of uh, keep that uh, end of the bag weighed down there like that. So that's all that's trying to replicate right there. The pallet was probably from the last time they bagged. Um, this, this full bag particular, we kind of figured that this was from last year, it's probably corn silage in it. Okay. And I tried to grow the grass around it to make it look like it, it's it been sitting there for a while. Sure. This uh, little area, they probably would mow a couple times a year and that's right. kind of why it's a little shorter everywhere else. So. Very cool. And then one other brass piece that stands out, you got the John Deere Gator and you got the uh, sprayer on, mounted on the back. Yeah, so... I'll let Andrew elaborate on the gator a little bit more, but uh, in this particular scene here, we have the uh, an actual uh, custom crew um, employee uh, operating the bagger, and he's up there on the platform right now talking to the farmer, probably asking how it's going or whatnot, if he needs anything or something like that. So the farmer, okay. that would be the farmer there on the gator and on the ground. So. Okay. And I'll let Andrew talk about that gator because it's quite impressive. Yeah, so when I went out by Dan's place, we had the gator sitting there. And we were looking at it and thinking, well, it needs something else because it was going to sit there just like this. So I believe it was Dan's idea to put a sprayer in the back. So I went home and like 24 hours later, I sent him a picture of the sprayer. All built from brass, tank is even brass. Mm. And then uh, I, I, this little secret, I do like to show that. I have an wow. engine in there with uh, the rear shocks. I tried to cram as much detail into this gator as possible. That is their choice. All I can say is good luck to the people that compete in these shows next because the bar has just been like, jumped no, 100 it. points. <laughs> Thank you. That's it, Dad. Well, it looks like we've got um, one more area to look at. Is um, looks like you're doing some wrapping of bells as well and again, great job it's kind of wrinkled looking and that that plastic garbage bag look yep and so this is kind of the uh, 
this doesn't have really much of anything to do with the actual chopping process, but it was just a detail that we wanted to add. We had a little bit of extra space. Uh, Andrew had, uh, I believe he had built the wrapper uh, and the bail wagon and stuff, so we kind of knew that we wanted to set it somewhere and make a scene for it. Now, is uh, that a horse wagon or? Uh, farm King. Farm the, the wagon is a Farm King. And you can talk more about the, the wrapper yep. and the wagon. And farm King like goes with versatile, so that's very cool. <laughs> yeah, I was able to, fortunate enough to find their website and was able to get measurements off of it. So it is scaled correctly to 36 feet. Um, I also built a bale grabber for the Puma and skid loader. And the bale wrapper is modeled after an Anderson RB680, I believe. Okay. So uh, the bale wrapping theory would have been obviously we're kind of trying to show the second cutting. So maybe these bales are probably from the first cutting. Of course, you don't got quite as good a protein and stuff for that first cutting. So these would be for an alternate for probably heifers or something like that, or if they keep steers back or something like that. The bales are actually uh, really neat too because we tried to pack as much detail on them and. Uh, when you look at these bales and pictures, they're actually they're, the edges are actually rounded off because they wrap them so tight. Mm -hmm. uh, so to do this, uh, we practiced that when Andrew was out there. Once again, we weren't very happy with our results. Uh, we had just used the Teflon tape technique that a lot of people had used in the past and just made felt bales uh, first. But our problem was that our bales were very inconsistent. I talked to Andrew on the phone. He had some time and I gave him, or we kind of bounced this idea of using a wood dowel for the core and the outer three or four wraps probably were felt to give the squishiness of the of it being wrapped. So that's a detail that we were really happy with how it came out. Uh, and the way these uh, the way these are stacked is actually a way that Andrew sent me a picture that a local dairy stacks there. So okay. it's kind of unique, but uh, it's kind of like view. a marshmallow pyramid. Here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're really happy with how that turned out. And, like I said, it's not a very important part of the display or anything. It doesn't no. have much to do with Just it. Just that added detail of the feed yard. Exactly, yeah, as this overflow kind of part of the yard and what they would all use it for, so. Well, again, guys, congratulations. Excellent work. Uh, I've said I really do not envy the people that come next to try to dream up the detail that you put in this one. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, all I can say about it is it, it, was, it was a lot of fun working with Andrew. It was a, it was a perfect match for me because I, I feel really confident in my scenery work and I'm not so great at the uh, scratch building and stuff like that. So when he was looking for someone to team up with, I was I was thrilled to do it. And uh, I just hope I complimented his stuff uh, good enough and did it justice. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun to do this for me. I don't know about him, but. <laughs> I'd say I made a great team. And again, the cool thing is, you know, this is not a four by eight foot display. It's very compact but it tells a great story and uh, the equipment tells the rest of the story in addition to the landscaping. So it's uh, yeah, we well deserved. We went with the smaller displays because uh, we hope that he can take these outside and get some outside pictures of them with it all set up, as well as we wanted to be able to pack as much detail as we could into the smaller display. So. Yeah. And I, um, I mentioned, I'm gonna zoom in on your shirt here. Dan is the model farmer on Instagram. Yep. And if you're looking to see some really nice pictures, check out Dan on Instagram. Yep, we got a lot of stuff going on here, and now that the winter and I'm done farming, I can uh, start getting back to the workbench and doing a lot of other stuff. So, yeah, feel free to give it a follow and keep uh, keep, in, keep following us and see what we do this winter. So, right. I would like to thank Dan. It was a pleasure to work with him, and I'm very happy with how everything turned out. Yeah, and uh, the one last thing I, I did mention earlier, I want to thank Chris Delva and Adam Frericks. They helped us set up this weekend and. We bounced a lot of ideas off them. We sat down last March in Sioux Falls at a table and kind of came up with the design of this and what we wanted to do. And they have both been instrumental, whether it's been us calling them and bouncing ideas off them to come in here and helping us set up at the actual show. So without those two, it, it, it wouldn't be possible either. So no. we want to thank them. So. Great team effort. You bet, so. you bet. All right, so. thanks a lot, guys. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for being that for us, Jason. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be able to share it with everybody. Yeah.